Is the Bible good news for women? Beth Moore from Texas was the first public female Bible teacher I came across. When I was at university, a few friends and I went through her Bible study on the book of Luke. I remember my heart pounding and my eyes filling with tears almost every Tuesday evening as we sat and listened. She taught in a way that inspired me to go deeper in my relationship with God. I'd leave those evenings wanting to worship and follow Jesus more. Years later, Beth has come under a lot of criticism. I saw a clip from one conference in which well-known male Bible teachers were mocking her and laughing about her on stage. I felt chilled to my core. Recently, I saw something that she wrote on Twitter. I've shortened it for our purposes. Women of faith, you get to have your own relationship with Jesus and love him with your whole mind, as well as your heart and soul, and you dang well get to study theology. You religious misogynists are so far gone from Christ's example in regard to women. The need for this message to be written to women today broke my heart. Where do these attitudes come from? The Bible does include passages which can be interpreted as being harsh or misogynistic. Who could read, women should be silent, or I do not permit a woman to teach or preach, for it was Eve who sinned first, or wives be subject to your husbands, not to mention a few of the Levitical laws which can also be shocking on first glance without drawing a straight line from them to misogynistic religious attitudes. When I was growing up, I was incredibly disturbed by the passages like these, and I wondered if the Bible promoted the sexism that I saw and encountered. But these passages, when seen in their specific contexts, from my perspective, cannot be understood as misogynistic. The purpose of this talk is to see if the Bible has an overarching message for women within which any controlling, patronizing, or misogynistic attitude needs to be challenged. Beth's comment at the end of her post is that an aggressive and controlling attitude towards women when it comes to the church is completely unlike Christ's example. A few decades ago, another female Christian thinker, this time coming out of Oxford, said something similar about Jesus' example with regards to women. Academic novelist and apologist Dorothy L. Sayers wrote, he, Jesus, never mapped out their woman's sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female. He had no axe to grind, no uneasy male dignity to defend. He took them as he found them and was completely unselfconscious. Within the comments of these two women lies a seeming contradiction. On the one hand, the value and respect and deep honoring of women that they have found in Christ, the very person at the heart of Christianity. And on the other, by stark comparison, the maltreatment of women within communities of those who claim to follow the same God of the Bible. This is a taste of what lies behind the question we're looking at. Christianity claims to be good news, but is the Bible good news for women? The first thing to say is that there is no question that the Bible has been used to defend and even commend the subjugation of women. This is an indisputable fact and a view held not simply by those on the fringe, but by leading thinkers of the church. And it's, of course, why we're talking about the question today. St. Augustine said, for example, I do not see what sort of help woman was to provide man if one excludes the function of bearing children. Thomas Aquinas called woman defective and misbegotten. And the revivalist John Wesley said, wife, be content to be insignificant. What loss would it be to God or man had you never been born? Were these comments outliers amongst influential Christian leaders? Sadly, the answer is no. Luther, Calvin, John Knox, the list can go on. And in my lifetime, I have witnessed a lot of direct and subtle sexism supposedly based on the Bible. However, it's also true that while the Bible has been used to oppress, it's also the Bible that has been used to challenge that very same oppression. You can read up more on the thinkers who've done this and brought these ideas to the fore in the notes that are included. This, of course, opens up the question of interpretation. If one person can use the Bible to oppress and one to challenge that oppression, is everything in the Bible open to any interpretation? This is a big topic and one we can't cover fully in this talk. But along with a lot of Bible scholars, I want to suggest that we can understand the overarching message of the Bible on this issue and give reasons why the Bible is good news for women. I'll explore this question by looking at it through six lenses. By the way, I should say there's lots to be said on this topic. So we're simply going to open the door today, but I hope you enjoy exploring it more for yourself. First, God's beautiful creation. Second, fall from that beautiful creation. Third, God's promise of restoration. Fourth, restoration shown most clearly in Jesus. Fifth, restoration inaugurated through the Holy Spirit in the church. And sixth, restoration fulfilled in the new creation.
Genesis 1, 26 and 27 tells us that God created men and women equal as co-image bearers, and together they are given the mandate to rule the earth. But immediately there are questions that can be raised. Let's look at some of them. Adam is created first. Does that mean that Adam is superior to Eve? Well, by this logic, animals are superior to humans and plants to animals, so that point doesn't really seem to hold. Something else that theologians have noted, whether literal or metaphorical, it seems to be of symbolic importance that woman was made not from Adam's head nor from his foot, but from his side, emphasizing togetherness and equality and diversity. Doesn't it say that woman is to be man's helper? Well, the Hebrew word used for helper is ezer. It's used a few other times in the Bible and each time to describe the help that God gives humanity in rescuing them. So for example, Exodus 18.4, the word Eze is used of God. God is my helper. Deuteronomy 33, 7 asks God to be Judah's help. And Psalm 33, 10 says, we wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and shield. It also does not imply the superiority of women. Women are described in Genesis 2, 18 to 20 as Eze Konegdo. Konegdo can be understood as like opposite, like a puzzle piece that is different to the other, but fits together perfectly. God has said that Adam was not good on his own. Now, God didn't just make a whole bunch of blokey friends for him, which he could have done. Instead, he made someone different to him. We also know that this isn't just about romance, although, of course, it's also about that. The Bible clearly states that marriage and singleness are of equal value. So this creation story is for everyone, not just for married people. We know that Jesus and Paul, for example, weren't married. This doesn't mean that they didn't need women in their lives. The creation story is about a beautiful expression of unity and likeness within diversity and difference. Adam's response when he sees Eve is this, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It's their togetherness which is emphasized. But then sin enters the world and begins to mess with the beauty of the interaction between men and women. We see that they are immediate results to the fall. They stop taking responsibility, they blame one another, and their sexual difference, which at first brought them delight, now brings them shame. Power differentials are only mentioned with the event of sin. The desire to rule over or dominate one another is expressed clearly as part of the brokenness that the man and woman now live within. This enmity between men and women is shown throughout Israel's history and is recorded in many horrific ways in the Bible. It becomes part of the narrative of human history. But the important thing to notice is that this enmity, this maltreatment of one another, is all part of a world that the Bible says has fallen away from God, away from the way that it was meant to be. This is a reality that we still live in and will be in until God finally renews all things fully. One way in which sexism has prevailed within Christian history has been the trope of Eve the seductress who tempts Adam into sin. This trope has had an awful impact on societies down the ages. But is it legitimate? Does the text itself ever place the blame on Eve? But the Bible itself does not make this point explicitly and indeed seems contrary to everything else that Paul taught about human nature in general and contrary to how he honored women in his ministry. To read more on this though, follow the links on the screen. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, the people of God are taught about who God is and how he differs from the ways of this world that they've come to know. In Joel chapter 2, 28 to 29, we're told in a prophecy that God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit on all people. And the emphasis is on inclusiveness. In Acts 1, 14 and 2, 1 to 4, that prophecy is fulfilled. We see that women ultimately become the recipients along with the men of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 3, 24 to 29, Paul explains that this new age of the Holy Spirit has huge implications for breaking down previous hierarchies and again, emphasizing the new togetherness. But even before Jesus' advent and the coming of the Holy Spirit, we see the Bible affirming and promoting the value and interests of women in a world riddled with patriarchy. As a taste of this, we see the matriarchs of God's people featuring as full and important characters. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel all play important and significant roles at the start of the story. Women who are abused and misused by the patriarchs, like Hagar and Leah, are not airbrushed out, but their stories are told and their value to God highlighted. 
Women are leaders, warriors, judges, and significant prophets. They serve in crucial moments in Israel's history. At the start of the Exodus story, for example, we find out that it is the brave midwives who use what they can to stand up to the tyranny of Pharaoh. Then we see Moses' mother and sister and Pharaoh's daughter all playing significant roles in protecting Moses. The story closes with a woman dancing on the shores of the Red Sea, celebrating liberation. The reason this is so important and why I'm going to spend a bit more time on this point is because the Bible tells us that Jesus shows us exactly what God is like. In Colossians 1.15, we're told that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And in John 14.9, we're told that to see Jesus is to see the Father. So if we want to understand what the God of the Bible thinks about women, we can study Jesus to know. Now, important place to start is to understand the cultural context of the New Testament. If we thought that the Old Testament times were hard on women, by the New Testament times, things were arguably worse as a result of the influence of Greek culture. Women were not educated, not getting the opportunity to either study or teach the Torah. While it's true that women were not included in priestly roles in the Old Testament times, Leviticus 15 seems to make it clear that this was because of ritual purity laws, not any inferior spiritual status. In fact, women were expected to read the law and participate fully in the spiritual life of the community and were not segregated in the place of worship. However, things deteriorated for women and they later became segregated in the synagogues. As the famous Jewish first century historian Josephus writes, the woman, says the law, is in all things inferior to the man. In fact, women were seen to be so inferior that men at that time prayed a daily prayer to God in which they said, Praise be to God that he has not created me a Gentile. Praise be to God that he has not created me a woman. Praise be to God that he has not created me an ignorant man. How does this compare with Jesus? You see as I go on that pretty much every single time Jesus interacts with women, he is breaking one or other cultural taboo of his time. In this way, we see his radical care for women, that he is far more concerned about caring for them than he is about obeying the norms of an oppressive culture. The first example of his rule breaking can be found in his genealogy. Jewish genealogies were, as a rule, patrilineal, meaning that descendants were traced through their father's line, not their mother's. And yet in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' disciples include four women, Rahab, Ruth, Tamar, and Bathsheba. These are women from foreign lands, other cultures, women whose lives were complex and who may have been seen as being morally compromised by religious elites. This is an astonishing collection of women to have made the list of the ancestors for the Son of God. And this hints at the very beginning of the gospel at the sort of person that Jesus is going to be. Jesus was friends with women and honored them when culture saw them as unclean or seductive. Luke 7.38 shows us that he welcomes women when others, including his disciples, are ashamed of them. John 11.5 shows us that Jesus spent time with Mary and Martha as well as with their brother Lazarus and they were included in his close circle of friends. Where certain laws had been turned into ways of segregating women, Jesus shows that the spirit of the law honors women. In Mark 5, we see Jesus affirming the woman who touches him in the hope of healing, despite the Levitical law of cleanliness, a law which separated women during their menstruation period. He goes on to touch a dead girl, again breaking a Levitical law, in order to show that the girl is more important than the law. Luke 13 shows us Jesus healing a woman on the Sabbath who had suffered for 18 years. He answers objections to this by calling her a daughter of Abraham, a phrase Jewish men would have seen as denoting God's favor. Teachers like Philo and Ben Sira blamed women for their evil allure, saying things like, turn away your eyes from a shapely woman and do not gaze at beauty belonging to another. Many have been seduced by a woman's beauty and by it passion is kindled like a fire and in blood you may be plunged into destruction. Contrast this with Matthew 5, where Jesus turns this around and shockingly says in his Sermon on the Mount that lust is a result of the sinful eye and the heart of the one who lusts. Next, Jesus included women in his teaching, frequently using examples both from the world of men and from the world of women. For example, winemaking was a man's job, and when Jesus says, don't pour new wine into old wineskins, he's speaking to the world of men. But then he turns to the world of women and talks about sewing cloth. 
Again, when Jesus is teaching about not hiding your light, he references lighting a city, which was a man's job. Then he turns to a woman's job and talks about lighting a home. He's including women constantly. We see this again in Luke 15, when he's talking about the shepherd looking for the lost sheep. Shepherding was a man's job. Then he talks about a woman on her hands and knees looking for a coin. He's constantly including the woman into his teaching. Next, Jesus had female disciples. In Matthew 12, 45, Jesus points to the crowd. He calls his disciples and he says, these are my mother and my brothers. Culturally, you would never point to a group of men and refer to them in the female. This means that it must have been a mixed crowd that he was referring to as his disciples. In Luke 10, 38, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. This was an official phrase used of a rabbi and their disciple. The same formula is used of Paul and Gamaliel in Acts 22, 3. Jesus strongly affirms Mary's choice to join his disciples when her sister Martha objects. Martha's unease with her sister's actions are most likely because Mary is breaking a cultural taboo by joining the men and learning theology rather than helping with the household tasks. Next, women are integrally involved in all three major salvation moments. First, the incarnation, Luke 1. We only know what happened because of Mary, the mother of Jesus. The cross, Mark 15, 40, we're told that the male disciples abandoned Jesus, but the woman stayed. So we know what happened there because of the testimony of women. And lastly, the resurrection. At that time, society said, this is the governing principle. Any evidence which a woman offers is not valid. That was first century rabbinic law. And Josephus wrote, but let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. But Jesus undercuts that. In Matthew 28, one to two and John 20, one to 10, we see Jesus appearing first to women and trusting them as the initial witnesses of his resurrection therefore honoring their testimony when society did not. In Romans 16, we see Paul honoring a whole list of women for their contribution to the church and church ministry. We also see Priscilla, along with her husband Aquila, having the job of teaching Apollos a better theology. In fact, many scholars have noted that it seems significant in the two places where this couple are mentioned in the New Testament, that it is the wife, Priscilla, who's mentioned first. This was unusual and so seems to denote some prominence in her teaching. Then we see Phoebe being called Diakonon, which was the same title used of the ministry of both Timothy and Paul. She was entrusted with the Book of Romans and is widely believed to have hosted the house church in Rome to whom she took the letter. Paul highlights Junia as notable among the apostles, drawing attention to her work, service and leadership. The focus seems to be in the New Testament, that the men together with the women are preaching the gospel. In fact, in Paul's writings in the New Testament, there seems to be a focus on women together with the men that was culturally unprecedented at the time. Lastly, we are told that there will be a restoration fulfilled in the new creation. In Revelation 21, 1 to 4, we see in the new creation that women have equal status with men and are co-inheritors of the kingdom of God. There's never any difference or distinction mentioned regarding what men and women will inherit and enjoy. And in all the passages about heaven, the emphasis always seems to be on togetherness of the people of God. So in conclusion, when sin came into the world, with it came enmity between men and women, attempts to dominate and disparage. However, as we have seen throughout the Bible, God is drawing his people away from interacting on the basis of shame and blame and into a restored unity and diversity. Having displayed this most clearly through Jesus, he now empowers us to be like him with the promise that one day we are gonna be fully restored together in his new creation. It's an exciting vision, and it's one that we are all invited to embrace. Hey guys, how are you doing? My name is Nathaniel, and I'm part of the Oka team. And I just wanted to say a big thank you for watching this film we made. At Oka, we really love to speak about the big questions of our time and to show how the Christian faith provides credible and valuable answers. If you've enjoyed this film, check out the other stuff on our channel, and also please consider subscribing and following us. It really helps to make more films like this. We also want to hear from you. So if you have any ideas for new content, please put them in the comments below or get in touch with us directly. Thanks goes out to all the speakers, donors and film team of which I'm a part of. 
And actually, fun fact, it takes around 60 hours to make all of these films. And that's because we want to make sure the content is incredibly well researched, it looks and it flows beautifully, and ultimately, that it's actually useful to you. So this means a lot of research, listening to our audience, and filmmaking. Our incredible staff at Oka who make these films are funded by donations. So if you want to partner with us with our work, please also consider donating, which is really easy on our website. See you next time.